Right, so this is where we, uh, where we left off um, yesterday. Uh, we were talking about basically this, this thing, this scientific method, and how maths is used in that. Okay. Um, so I'll just, I think I have to close that now to make it go away. Um, which is this one. Um, so this is, this, is, um, this is a really, I mean, it does say a trivial example. But, so the actual maths involved. In okay, so, um, so this, is, this is another example of, of this. So um, this was a, a news article that uh, came out, I think, last year, year before last, uh, last year. Um, so Edinburgh is, is changing its speed limit to 20 miles an hour over loads of the city. Okay, so this is pretty good if you like walking or cycling. Um, but when this came out, um, so this was a Facebook post by... Uh, one of the lecturers in, uh, in the department, uh, who is, um, uh, you know, um, anonymous now, because uh, it's a pretty stupid post to put. But so they've made this statement that they're not so happy about this, okay, because they think their one hour bus journey to work, okay, is going to take an hour and a half now, okay? So they've, 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 they've basically done a little bit of maths based on their understanding of how they think this system works. Okay, and this is the system, so they've changed the speed limit from 30 miles an hour to 20 miles an hour. Okay, and the model that uh, this lecturer uh, is using to understand the system is speed equals distance divided by time. Okay, it's a very, very simple model. Okay, it's just a very simple equation. Um, and you can rearrange that equation however you want. Okay, not however you want, you can only use it, you can rearrange it using the rules. Um, but they've times both sides by time and divided both sides by speed to rearrange that to get an equation that tells them how long it will take to go any distance if they're going a particular speed. Okay? Now, to work out how long the new journey will take, okay, so we've got, we can use the old time of the commute is equal to the distance divided by the old speed, so 30 miles an hour. Uh, now in the future, the distance won't change, but the new time will be the distance divided by the new speed. So you can do some more rearranging here. Okay, so we've got two equations. Okay. Um, we can rearrange both of these equations to give us an equation for the distance. Okay, so the distance equals the old time divided times the old speed. It also equals the new times times the new speed. Okay. So now we've got one equation which we can then rearrange this part here, okay, because now this is equal to that, and that gives us the new time, okay, without even to need to know how far the journey is, okay. So it's the old time times the old speed, all divided by the new speed, okay. Um, so in this case, we're basically just taking the old time, which was an hour and timesing it by um, 30 dividing by 20. So we're basically timesing it by one and a half. They, they don't want to come in. Okay, so this gives the prediction that the one hour journey will now take uh, one and a half hours. Okay? Um, so what we then do as scientists, we do this scientific method thing. Okay, so we then go through and look at, uh, we've identified a problem, we've got a, sorry, hi. Uh, can I borrow three chairs because we don't have enough chairs in Ah, uh, yeah, sure, fill your boots. Thank you. We do some maths on this if you want to. They were <laughs> eight chairs, three chairs. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we've, we've, we've basically formed a hypothesis using the, our maths, okay, using this model speed equals distance divided by time. Um, and what we're going to do now is we're going to make some observations. So we, what we could do is kind of devise an experiment where we sit on the bus and force the bus driver to drive at 20 miles an hour and not 30 miles an hour. Okay, or you could go on the bus with a GPS and a logger and see when the bus is going over 30 miles an hour and when it's not and work out what the time difference would be, all these kind of things. Okay, so people, people did this because, you know, they're geeks. Uh, and it turns out that rather than taking half an hour longer, okay, the journey actually only takes two and a third minutes longer. 
Okay. So, um, so I think uh, we could we could I think I have a top hat thing for this. It's going to be very exciting. Okay. So uh, we're going to start now with uh, the actual mathematical content of the course. Um, so we're going to go through these uh, subscript, uh, superscript, and some scientific number formats today, hopefully. Okay. And uh, then if we're in time, we'll do another example of, of how the, the model thing works. Maths? Yeah. Okay. So uh, before we start with the actual maths, uh, in maths and in science, quite often we have... Yeah, this is... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we have all of these Greek symbols for that represent numbers. So it's just substituting uh, a variable in an equation for a symbol. Uh, it doesn't really matter. You don't, I'm, nobody's going to expect you to learn all of these. Okay. So hopefully I'll remember to explain which one of them, what they represent as we, as we go along. Okay. Uh, but they're, they're just an arbitrary way of representing a generic number as a, as a, a variable in, a, in an equation. Okay, we may use them. Um, some of them, uh, like explicitly theta, is quite often um, used to represent an angle. Um, some of them are quite special, so pi is quite <coughs> often used to represent the number pi, which uh, we may come to. Um, alpha and beta are quite often used as constants because that's a constant A, constant B. Um, some of these are terms like angular momentum or decay constants, but uh, doesn't really matter because um, it's the mass that matter, not the, the, the symbols we use for it. Okay, and I will try to do that. Okay, so uh, superscripts and subscripts. Okay, so these are basically little numbers or symbols that appear kind of just a little bit above or below a variable. So this could be a number. This big X could be anything. This could be a number. So it could be 10, it could be 5, it could be 27 and a half. Or it could be one of those variables. It could be alpha, beta, one of those. Okay? So, um, so the subscript, the thing that goes down at the bottom, doesn't usually doesn't mean anything mathematical. Okay? It usually just tells you something about that number. Okay? So if, uh, for instance here, if X was this Greek uh, Greek row that looks like a P but is actually the Greek letter for R. Um, we might have a, a subscript after it that tells us that's referring to a property of air. Okay, or it could be of water. So in this case, this is the variable for the property, the density of water. Okay, so that's it's usually just a descriptive thing. Okay, so it's not usually mathematically relevant. Okay, the thing that goes at the top, however, um, I'll try and do that. Okay, so the, the thing at the top, the superscript, is important mathematically, almost always. Okay, um, and this is called the exponent. Okay, and this is is a number which um, uh, which is how many times this variable is times by itself. Okay, so very the simple example that most of you should have come across with x with an exponent of 2, sometimes called x squared, okay, uh, is x times x. Okay, so it's times itself essentially twice. You've got two x's in there. Okay? Similarly, x to the power of 3, is it times 3 times? Okay? Okay, so I'll just, um, just leave that back for a moment up there and uh, just, just quickly go over so on. So if we had a number, so if, if we've got, say, x, and x equals 10, okay? You guys see that? Green is okay. Okay, some of the colors are slightly not seeable. Um, so in this case, x squared is equal to x times x. I should make these curly x's so it's obvious. Let's imagine curly x's. Um, which is, in this case, equal to 10 times 10. So it's basically a list of, of numbers, and you've got two of them. Okay, so in this case, 10 times 10 is 100. Yeah? Super straightforward. So, um, so we have some rules which helps us deal with these exponents when we are doing maths. Okay? 
And these are rules which are worth learning. They're certainly worth writing down so you could take these rules into your exam with you. Um, so if we've got two, two variables that have exponents, and we do maths to them. So if we've got a variable uh, times something, and then the same variable raised to the power of something else. So in this case, we've got, say, maybe x squared times x to the power of 5. OK? So in this case, what you do is you just, as long as this variable at the bottom is the same, you just add, them, add the exponents together. OK? So that would be, uh, what is that? x to the power of 7. Okay. And we can just go through that in terms of uh, if x is 10, it should be 10 squared times 10 to the power of 5. Okay. Uh, so we could, we could write that, and that would be 10 to the 7. We could write that out as, as non-exponential numbers. So that would be 10 times 10 is 100. Yep, happy with that. Excellent, lots of smiley faces. 10 to the power of 5 is is a hundred thousand okay a hundred times a hundred thousand is equal to ten million okay now you can see in earth sciences geosciences um, most sciences especially physics things like that um, we quite often deal with huge numbers enormous numbers numbers of molecules of water in the ocean or um, the age of the Earth, okay, big numbers, okay, 3.457, I think, billion, four point, it's a large number, okay, the age of the Earth, I should really know the age of the Earth, okay, so if we were to write out the age of the Earth in SI units, okay, in seconds, okay, that would be an incomprehensibly large number, and I'd be doing lots and lots of zeros and all kinds of things, right, and that would be, so using these exponents is a really easy way of, of basically condensing those numbers down to something that's manageable, okay, to deal with. Okay, so that's why, why we use them. So uh, similarly when we're, uh, the, kind of the next rule is we're dividing one variable by that variable um, to an exponent. So x over x if this is raised to 2. Okay, so in this case, we just take away the 5 from the 2. So that is going to be x to the power of minus 3. Okay? Okay, so I've introduced this minus 3 in here. So that's a bit weird, right? You can't time something by itself a negative number of times. Okay? So what... Where you have an exponent with a negative number, any negative number, okay, all that means is that is 1 divided by x to the power of the positive of that. Okay? So in this case, if x was 10, okay, uh, this would be 1 over 10 to the power of 3, which is... 1 over 1,000, okay, which is 0.001, okay? So similarly, with really, really, really small numbers, okay, we would be dealing with 0.0000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
power 3. Okay? So 10 squared is 100. 100 times 100 times 100. Okay? So 100 times 100 times 100 is 100 times 100 times 100. Okay? So that's a million. Okay? And that's the same as 10 to the power of 6. Okay? So in this case, all we're doing is we're timesing these numbers together. Okay? So there's a... What's going on there? Okay, so there, there are other... Let's move that little top hat thing out of the way. So there are other useful, useful exponent things which are... Continuous. So x times itself, no matter what x is, is always 1. Okay? And x to the power of 1 is always just x. Okay? There's another kind of uh, thing that you should, should be aware of uh, is that um, x, if you have a fractional thing up here, x to the power of, or x to the 0.3, something like that, okay, you can still do that. I mean, that's still a valid expression, okay? But what this means is that uh, in, where you've got a fraction up here, okay, that's in between 0 and 1, or 0 and minus 1, this is some form of, it's the same as saying the square root of x. Okay? Or if this was, if this was 0.3 recurring, so x to the power of a third, okay, this would be the cubed root of x. Okay? Okay, so what we're going to do now is, um, is some, just uh, some examples of these. So I think, I think, I think, I think this works. Okay, so uh, I'm going to. So we've done a little bit of maths, and I think everyone kind of like uh, followed that, which was quite good. Um, so what we're going to do now is to, is is a little bit of an example similar to the um, the scientific method things that we were talk well, I was talking about earlier on. So what we're talking about now is some clouds. Okay, so this is the kind of science that Massimo does. It's not the kind of science I do, so you have to bear with me a little bit. Okay? So, um, one of the questions that, uh, that a meteorologist might ask is, why, why, is there, why, are there, why is there a cloud here, okay, and not here? Okay? So, one of the questions is, like, basically, what are the processes that control cloud formation? Okay? So, what I want you to do now is to lick your finger. Everyone, everyone, everyone else at the back has done it. <laughs> okay, now blow on it. Okay, okay. So you feel that like your finger is getting cold? Yeah. Did anybody's finger get warmer? This is weird. Okay, so what's happening here is that your finger—I mean, you can do this with any any body part—is uh, that you blow on it, okay, and that promotes the evaporation of water. Okay, and that process requires energy, okay? So basically what's happening is the water is taking energy from your finger and making your finger cold, and that energy is going into turning that water into water vapor, okay? Now, the opposite of that evaporation process is condensation, okay? So when you condense water from a water vapor, from a water vapor, from, from, from water vapor into the cloud, that puts energy back into the system, okay? So it takes water, energy out of the water vapor and gives it back to the environment, okay? So that's kind of like a free process. It happens spontaneously. So if the conditions are right for water vapor to turn into kind of water, liquid water, that gives up energy to the environment. That's a spontaneous process, okay? So if there's, the conditions are right, we should form clouds. Clouds, they're great, yeah? But um, when you condense water from a gas to a liquid, that water has a surface, okay? Okay, this might be some, some, some droplets, okay? And it turns out that having a surface 
on a liquid, particularly water, that has a really high surface tension, okay, that requires lots of energy. So for every bit of surface you, you, you create, okay, you've got to put energy from the environment into the water. Now, um, so this is why um, water droplets are round. It's because for any given volume of, of water, okay, the minimum surface area is a sphere. Okay, so the water drop is trying to minimize the amount of energy it needs to create that surface. Okay? So you've got two processes going on that kind of give and take energy from the environment and into and out of the water. Okay, so if you grow the droplet, okay, so if you, the droplet gets bigger, okay, so you're changing the state of that water from gas to liquid, and that's, that's, that gives you energy. Okay? So that, that means that the water is basically giving up energy into the environment. But as you grow the, the little uh, droplet, okay, the surface area gets bigger. Okay? And the surface area gets bigger, so you've got to put energy into creating that surface. Okay? Because all of the water, I guess if you do oceanography, that's an option, or a core course, depending on whatever, then you'll find out why uh, water has got this really high surface tension and why it requires so much energy. Okay, but that you see that also gets bigger as the, the droplet gets bigger. Okay, so uh, you can work out how much energy is required for each of these processes by um, by some really simple equations. Okay, so the area of a sphere is four pi r squared, and the volume of the sphere is four pi r cubed. Okay, so those are the size of the droplet, as that gets bigger, okay, so the, the energy change will be proportional to um, the uh, radius squared or the radius cubed, times some constant. So I've just put, uh, so this symbol here is kind of like equals, it's just proportional to. So it means it changes in the same way as, but it's not absolutely equal to, um, because we don't know what the constant is. Okay, so the constant here will be something to do with the enthalpy of um, condensation, which is some number for every mole of water that you condense, you get a certain amount of energy back. This will be the energy per surface area. That could be some value. Okay, we don't know what that value is. It doesn't matter for this. Okay? But the key thing is that these have different exponents. Okay? So one, as, the, as the, the droplet gets bigger, gets bigger to the radius squared, and the other one gets bigger to the radius cubed. Okay? Okay, so which of these is going to dominate? Because if this is giving us energy for free, no energy is free, but... And this one is costing us energy. The drop can only grow spontaneously if we're, in a, if we're, if we're winning energy. Okay? So this guy is getting... Radiuses are non-gendered. Um, this, this radius here is getting, is getting bigger more because it's r cubed than this radius r squared. Yeah? You see, if, 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 this, if r was 10, okay, and it went from, uh, this would be 1,000 and this would be um, 100. And if we grew that to 100, okay, we made our drop 100 times bigger, this one would have gone up to uh, 10,000, whereas this one would have gone up to uh, a million. Okay? So for a small, for, for growing the drop size, this one gets bigger faster than this one. Yeah? Happy with that? Okay? So it's not true. Okay? It's not true because what happens when your radius is actually very, very small? Okay? So uh, when the radius is very, very small, uh, this number, r squared, you're timesing a small number by itself many times. So I won't use brown because that's useless. Uh, so if you've got, say, 10 squared and 10 cubed, yeah? So we're raising a big number. 10 is a big number. Um, if it's houses you own, 10 is a big number. I guess if it's pounds you own, it's a small number. Um, but if we take another number, 0 0.1, yeah? And raise that. Okay? So this is going to be 100. This is going to be 1,000. Okay? So 
by having a bigger exponent, that makes the numbers bigger. Yeah? But if the, the thing you're raising the power to is small, 0.1 times 0.1, Yeah, uh, which we could, we could, we could, we could. If you didn't follow that bit, we can, we can, we can do it in a kind of, in our, in the way that we were doing it before. So we could go, uh, 0.1 is actually equal to uh, 10 to the power of minus one. Okay, and we could square that. Yeah, and then that, those two times this together. So that is equal to 10 minus 1 times 2 is minus 2, and that is the same as that. Um, so the point is that when, when these guys, when the radius of our drop is small, okay, and we increase the, the size of the drop, it's actually this term gets bigger faster than this one. So what this means is that for very, very small drops, for the smallest drops, it's actually the area of the drop that's more important than the volume of the drop. So that means that, so as our radius um, gets bigger, okay, uh, this is kind of the energy of rain. We need to put energy in, okay, to get the drop bigger until we get past some, some point, which depends on these constants, but it's not really important. And then we get basically free energy back out and our drops can grow spontaneously bigger. Okay, which is great, which means we get big drops in our clouds. But what this does mean is that we can't go from no droplets to a very small droplet. So if you've got no clouds to start off with, you can't grow the first very small drops. So this model of how the, um, of how the, the system works um, predicts that clouds shouldn't exist because you need extra energy to start these very small drops existing to overcome this initial surface energy. Okay. And this is kind of also explaining this, this, this uh, graph down here, which I kind of forgot to mention. So all this graph is, is the slope of this line. Okay, so this is, uh, we've got a, a positive gradient. So you see the line is going up down here. And then by the time we get to this point here, our gradient starts to be negative. So let's go down. So for any small kind of uh, increase in the radius size, if this number is positive, we've, we've got we're going we've got to go up. Okay, so this is this process of going from one curve to the slope of that curve is a process called differentiation. Okay, and we'll come on to that at the end of the course. Okay, so this is just a little bit of a teaser to sh to show you this is kind of the stuff we do at the end is kind of going to be relevant. Okay. So we could do our scientific method thing, right? We've got this equation. We think we've, we've done some physics by licking our finger, somebody else's finger. We've, we've blown on it. We, we, we think we work out how the energy of a cloud works, OK, in terms of when we condense water, that should give us energy. But we've got surface area to overcome. So that predicts that we shouldn't get clouds. So all of that physics, OK, doesn't make sense with our observations. Because if you can look out the window, you can see that there are clouds. Okay, very simple observation shows that we need to go back and revise our model. Okay, there's, in case it wasn't a cloudy day, I, I put a picture of clouds in, which is kind of a bit of overkill for Scotland. Um, so, um, so actually, if we, um, uh, if we do some different physics, we can, we can start to explain why clouds exist. So if you're, if you're going to do... Um, uh, <laughs> if it's fine. It's it's got another maths course to go to. It's going to be hilarious. Um, so if you actually do some slightly different physics that take into account that, that clouds actually condense onto small particles of dust in the atmosphere, okay, and actually the curvature of the raindrop matters and things like that, um, you can actually start to explain that clouds do exist and come up with a model that works. So you just revise your physical model okay, if your maths doesn't work out. Okay? So this is, a, this is not... Part of EMP, do not write this down. If you're interested in clouds, um, there are two courses uh, on meteorology which might be of interest to you, um, one of which Maslow teaches. Okay, so this, this gives us a slightly different curve. Okay, in this case, the droplets only need to be really, really small compared, basically, if the, if the bit of dust is bigger than kind of 
these really, really small <coughs> radiuses, we can start to grow our cloud. Okay, so um, for the rest of the lecture, we're just going to talk about um, dealing with these numbers that are really big or really, really small, and how using these exponents can kind of help us. Okay? So, uh, just some examples of, of numbers that are ridiculously large or ridiculously small. So, um, so, I mean, Earth scientists are quite often interested about the planet Earth. Okay? So, the planet Earth is sort of a radius of uh, 6,400 ish kilometers. Okay? So, that can be expressed in this. This notation here, and we'll just go on to explain what that kind of notation is. Uh, you know, other things might be slightly smaller. This is maybe only, you know, uh, that is 100 kilometers kind of scale. It actually says 100 kilometers, why I had to work out 1 times 10 to 5. But also, um, you know, things that affect these large Earth systems can actually be very small. So, kind of marine. Plankton, diatoms, tiny little things, okay, have a huge impact on the climate system, okay? So if we wanted to kind of like maybe work out how many of these things you could fit in a bit of ocean, you'd need to work with these really big numbers and these really small numbers, okay? And to do that, we have this thing of scientific notation, which some of you may be familiar with um, from science courses you did at school. Okay. Um, orders of magnitude. Um, I'll come on to that. Okay, so this is general form of the scientific number. Okay, there's three numbers in a scientific number. There's a first number, which is usually a number between one and ten. Okay. And it can have lots of digits on it, depending on how precise you think you know that number. And then there's another number which is almost always 10. Okay? And then there's an exponent. And that is usually a whole number. So it's an integer number, like 1, 2, 3, 4. But it can also be negative. Okay? So uh, minus 5, minus 300, something like that. It's never going to be minus 300. Okay, this explains what these are. Okay, so here, the age of the Earth, which I you know, totally remembered and didn't have to write down. The age of the Earth is uh, 4.543, so it's um, 4 billion years old, okay? And that's written down in scientific notation, 4.5 times 10 to the power of 9. So it's basically uh, the, um, this thing, the um, base number, if it's 10, and the exponent describes the order of magnitude of um, the number. So when this changes by one, it basically makes this number 10 times bigger. Okay, and it's, a, it's a really convenient way of dealing with, uh, dealing with stuff. Okay, so these are other large numbers which we might want to think about uh, representing as, um, as in scientific notation. Do I have next? Okay. Um, so, to, to finish off, I'm going to just think about how you actually enter these numbers into your calculators and how you work with them on Excel. Okay? So, first of all, the exponents. I guess most of you have figured out how to use the exponent function on your calculator. Okay, so that usually if you want to raise a number to another number, there'll be, there'll be a couple of buttons on your calculator. So there'll be one that hopefully looks like x squared. There might be one that's y to the x. Okay? So usually you'll press the number, so if you wanted 5 to the power of 4, you press 5, y to the x, then 4. Okay? Now, uh, in Excel, if you wanted to raise a number to a power, okay, and some of you got laptops out, you might be able to fiddle around with this. Um, if I wanted to do uh, 4.5 raised to the power of 7, I mean, 
mean, there's no reason why that particular number is important. The way to enter that as a number in Excel is 4.5, and then there's a little hat, okay, which is usually shift 5, maybe. I could put my own keyboard, couldn't I? That would be 6, maybe. Could be 5 when you're off. Okay, little hat, and then number 7. Okay. Now, this thing after, you, you might come across an equation that might look something like 4.5 raised to the power of something in a bracket, 5 plus uh, 7 times 9, something like some, some, some equation in that bracket. And then the result of that is the exponent. In that case, you'd have to just put brackets in here, plus 5, whatever. Okay? So that's that's basically exponents is the little hat. Now, most calculators and Excel have a bit of a shortcut for working in the scientific number format. Okay? So some calculators have a button that actually explicitly says something like times 10 to the power of x. Okay? Some calculators have a button that says EXP. Okay? You're going to have to get to know what your calculator does and don't lose that calculator and then get another calculator for the exam and then not learn what that one does because that would, that would ruin your afternoon um, or 8 o'clock exam in the morning. Um, so on your, um, so yes, yeah, sometimes this one might be called 10X. Okay? But to enter on your calculator, Say the number, in this case, 3 times 10 to the power of 3. You type 3. This is a really bad example. I should have probably used different numbers for that. But let's, let's do the age of the Earth. So what was it? 4.3 something, something, whatever it was. Okay? Times 10 to the power of 9. Okay? If you wanted to enter that on your calculator, okay, you type 4.3 something, something, something. Okay? And then you'd hit this button... EXP. Yep. And then 9. Okay? And then if you hit that on your calculator, maybe if you press equals, then it will give you the number as many, many significant figures like, did, like in a normal number. Okay? So that's how to do it on your calculator. Now, uh, I'm not sure if I have it on the um, Excel on the, on the next slide. Uh, um, in Excel, Excel does have a function, exp, okay? It does something completely different, okay? So if you want to enter this number, that number there, 4 point something, 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 times 10 to the power of 9, in Excel, uh, it's 4.33, whatever, whatever the number is, and then e, just the, the letter e on your keyboard, Okay? Um, it's really annoying that Excel does that. <laughs> it's like really annoying. Um, so um, remember that. This will save you lots of time in Excel practicals. Okay? So I think this is a good place to stop um, as any. Um, if you have any questions or whatnot, then um, you, can, you can ask them. Uh, you can email me. Um, there, one thing I didn't point out yesterday, 